We are privileged tonight to have one of America's top commentators, political analysts, political strategists. Everyone admires this man, Democrats and Republicans uh, alike. And his record in victories is phenomenal. The, you, you know him, so I'm not going to do a long introduction, but I'm going to tell you one little story. He, when he was nine years old, he decided he was for Richard Nixon. This was a 60 presidential campaign. So he gets a bumper sticker, and he puts it on his bicycle basket. And this is a true story, right? It's in his book. It's in his book. I'm taking away his speech. And he, drive, he rides his bike up and down the streets, unfortunately in front of a girl a little older and about 30 pounds heavier, who grabs him off the bike, beats him up. <laughs> But he persisted. He persisted. He was still for Richard Nixon. Ladies and gentlemen, please say hello to Carl Rowe. Thank you so much. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Enough. Enough. Your Southern Californians behave yourselves. <laughs> Mr. President. Sandy, where, where'd you depart to quickly? There you go. Mr. President. Actually, Sandy sounds better. Thanks for that uh, overly generous and largely inaccurate introduction. <laughs> and uh, thanks also for uh, killing part of my speech. He is right. She, was, uh, she did have about 30 pounds on me. A little Catholic girl across the street who was wild for Kennedy gave me a bloody nose. <laughs> I've never liked losing ever since. Actually, uh, I was uh, 18 when I met Nixon. I had won a scholarship program. Only reason I went to college. I won a $1,500 a year scholarship from the William Randolph Hearst Foundation in the U.S. Senate Youth Program. And they chose two kids. They still do it today. Two kids from every state. And they give them a scholarship and they take them to Washington for a week. So I, I've always loved politics. As long as I can remember, I've loved politics. I was like the complete nerd Nick. You know, in the fifth grade when you took your first civics course and you had to write an essay, you know, you probably wrote about our Constitution, the separation of powers, the three branches of government, the Declaration. I wrote mine on the theory of dialectical materialism. <laughs> I'd had a briefcase and a hush puppies pocket protector. I was like one weird little dude. But I won the scholarship and I loved politics and I went to Washington and I got to meet all kinds of people. And the week ended with us being hosted at the White House by the newly elected President of the United States, Richard Nixon. And so we were organized, all 102 of us I think there were, uh, 50, uh, 50 states and the District of Columbia, maybe 104. I think Puerto Rico was also had a couple of kids. And uh, they organized us, and the Westerners were the last. Now, you can say a lot of things about Nixon, but one thing you can't say about Nixon was that he was good at the small talk. So you can imagine the President of the United States standing in line, shaking hands with 104 young kids, uh, all of them high school seniors, and standing in line. And so we were, we were behind the very cute girl from New Mexico, the two Utah boys, and uh, I, funny I remember that. Uh, <laughs> and we come up and Nixon is there and we get introduced, the other kid and I. He was the high school athlete, I was the high school nerd. And we get introduced to Nixon and Nixon says, Utah, I love it when the Mormon Tabernacle Choir sings, this is my country. <laughs> I thought this is really weird. <laughs> <clears throat> I want to thank the uh, Beverly Smith who gave me the quick tour today of the, uh, these docents are terrific and uh, they really are. And, uh, 
Beverly gave me, gave me the quick tour. She did really didn't need to take me into Marine One, been in it a couple of times, <laughs> like 10 gazillion. And, uh, but I did, I did want to see what the, the old one looked like. And, uh, but anyway, we were going through the library and I had a deja vu moment because there in the 1972 campaign display was a button that I designed as the executive director of the College Republican National Committee. It's a really cool blue and yellow button that said, right on, Mr. President. <laughs> I told her I'd send her a couple of the other great examples of the buttons. This was, of course, you may not know this, but that's how we won the 1972 election, was the yellow and blue button. I also want to thank the officers and uh, board members of the Nixon Foundation. We understand America if we understand our presence. We understand better what our country is, where it's been, where it's going, if we understand the 44 men who have been privileged to serve as the nation's chief executive. I, I must admit I did have a sort of a weird feeling walking into this room because I was at the White House for nearly seven years and spent a lot of time in this room. I was in this room for Christmas parties and Hanukkah parties. I was in this room for visits of foreign leaders for news conferences. I was in the room when the Medal of Honor was posthumously awarded. And uh, you can't help but live and work in the White House and realize that it's a place of enormous history and consequence. Uh, you know, you walk in the gates of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and you realize that the house in which our president lives has been occupied by every president since John Adams. It was in the East Room of the White House that literally Thomas Jefferson would dine alone and would also hang his wash up to white, to dry. Uh, outside of the East Room on the south side is a, uh, excuse me, on the southwest side is a tree planted by Andrew Jackson that still is on the south side of the White House today, a gigantic magnolia. Jefferson designed the colonnade uh, that uh, extended west from the White House and just today just magically fits the White House and the West Wing together. Though the White House was built over a hundred years before the West Wing was. It was in the East Room of the White House that uh, one president, Abraham Lincoln, asked another president to stand on a couch, a future president, so that everyone could see what the victor of Vicksburg, Ulysses S. Grant, looked like. And it's in the East Room of the White House in which several presidents have laid in state. So, sort of weird being back here. Uh, I, they're going to be, I have to give the obligatory pitch for the book. I didn't work at the White House thinking, you know, keeping notes. You can't keep notes, in part because of the Nixon years, they tell you don't keep a diary. And for God's sake, don't put anything on tape. <laughs> but I didn't go to the White House thinking I was going to be there. Look, the average tenure of a senior White House aide is about 18 months. So I thought I'd come and go pretty quickly. And I never came thinking I'd be there for nearly seven years or that I'd write a book about the experience. But I'd come to a point in the summer of 2007 in which it was time for me to go. And I went reluctantly to my, my friend and my boss, the president, and said, time for me to go. And he said, no, stick around. And I said, I can't. I'm broke, asked way too much of my family, had legal bills that were just astronomical. And I said, I, I just got to go. I, I didn't want to go. I'm a stubborn enough guy. I wanted to be the last guy out on January 20th of 2009. But it was time to go. And so um, I set a date. and. A week or so later, he said, come and have lunch with me. And we went into a room off of the Oval Office of President's private dining room, and it's, he hung a gigantic picture of John Q. Adams in there, the, the other son of a former president. And uh, we were having lunch. We were having a very fancy White House lunch. He was having the no-fat hot dog. I was having the uh, peanut butter and jelly on whole wheat toast. But we splurged. We both had the yogurt with berries on it for dessert. <laughs> anyway, over the course of it, he said, I want you to write a book. I was a little taken aback because, you know, writing about the White House is not something that people are supposed to do. But he said, I want you to write a book. He said, I want you to be honest. I want you to be direct. I want you to say the things that we got right and the things you think we got wrong. 
And I said, Mr. President, why do you want me to do it? He said, look, history's going to get right, but we need to help history get it right. So write a book. So I did. And uh, it was an experience. I mean, because I had to reconstruct things from my calendars and from my memory and from newspaper articles, and I had to reach out to literally, the best thing about it was I literally had to have hundreds of interviews with former colleagues at the White House in order to get the color of the moment. Because when things move like they move in any White House, about the speed of light, and when you're drinking from a fire hose 24 hours a day, you can remember the big decisions, but the, you know, the, the publisher keeps saying, give us some color, you know. What, how did you feel, you know? <laughs> So, anyway, I had a lot of fun writing the book. And it's a little bit of a pugnacious book. But I'm a sort of a pugnacious guy, I admit it. But I wanted to write about the consequences of eight, of eight really consequential years. And I wanted to write about the courage of one man. So I did. I had a sort of odd experience when I finished the book. Because when you're writing a book, and this is the first book I ever wrote, you end up, during the end of the process, you've written a book, and you're honing it, and you're reducing it, and at the end, you go from, at the beginning, being concerned about this big arc of a narrative to the end of the book being focused on, what about this word, and what about this sentence, and what about this paragraph? And so you lose sight of the big narrative, and you begin to focus on, is that the right word, is that the right fact, is it this, or is it that? And you keep honing it, and refining it. So, the week before the book came out, in March of last year, my editor, sent me a package. And it was a very fancy package. It, in fact, the messenger would not leave it. I had to sign for it. And inside was the first copy of the book that I ever saw, which was sort of like, you know, ugly face on the cover, weird, but there it is. And with it was a note. And she said, you're going to start off next week by going on the Today program with Matt Lauer tiny little guy, about this tall, <laughs> tiny little hands, tiny little features, tiny little shoes, clad in Italian leather. Not a bad guy, but a tiny little guy. <laughs> anyway, she said, you're going to be on with Matt Lauer, and it would be useful before you go on Matt Lauer if you would sit down and read the book again to refresh your memory. And, it's, and she was right, because she, I, mean, I had a brilliant editor, but she was right, because you're, you're so focused on the little minor things that you want to step back. So I sat down, this is like a Tuesday afternoon, and I sat down and started to read. And I read Tuesday night, got up the next morning, read it through, finished it, closed the book and thought to myself, this is a damn good read. <laughs> Second thing I thought to myself was, thank God for editors. <laughs> anyway, if you, if you haven't read the book, I hope you do. Uh, if you have read the book, thank you. Uh, and I hope you enjoy it if you, if you do tuck into it. Uh, let me talk a little bit uh, about politics and then answer, duck, your questions. I've gotten really good since going on Fox about ducking questions. but. <laughs> And I don't mean to be too intensely political because we are here in a non-political place, but let me talk a little bit about the... <laughs> let me talk a little bit about the 2012 election. But let me start by winding it back a little bit to about nearly three years ago, two years and 11 months ago. We had an historic election. And the, uh, I was at Rhodes College in early 2009 and I said, I called it an historic election. I thought it was really odd. I'm Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. And some little 20-year-old kid stands up and says, what do you mean historic? And I said, it's historic because, I said, three miles away from here in April of 1968, Martin Luther King was gunned down by a bigot for having the courage to believe that every man and every woman, regardless of their color, regardless of their race, regardless of their background, had a right to register and vote and make their voice heard in our great democracy. But I thought about it afterwards, you know, we, many in this room remember that moment. We remember where we were when we heard the word of King's assassination. And yet, here's some kid, three miles away from the act, from the, from the place of the act, who doesn't connect how big it, a, a thing it is 
for our country to have in, a li in our lifetimes to elect an African-American president of the United States. And he had the best wishes of the country. And he had a big opportunity. He had an opportunity to sort of close the books on the acrimonious decade of the 90s with Gingrich and Clinton saying ugly things about each other. He had a chance to sort of turn the page on Bush. Look, I, I love George Bush. I believe he did what, was, what he did was right. But I also understood that by 2008, people were tired. They didn't like the war, and they wanted something different. And he could have turned the chapter, turned that particular page, closed that chapter, and, and done what he said he did in the campaign. It was inspiring, whether you're for him or against him. When he said, I don't want to be the president of red states or blue states, but the United States, he said something that mattered to every one of us. And he came into office with the best wishes of the American people. And yet today, he has the lowest approval rating of any modern president at this point in their first term. No president has ever been reelected with numbers this low. He has seen enormous drop-off. I've charted the drop-off among people by measuring his approval rating on his inauguration day and where he is today. And among the groups of, of whom there's the biggest decline are independent voters, college-educated voters, women, Latinos, and young people. He's seen a 30% drop among young people. And the interesting thing is, it's not because these people hate him. They don't. It's because they're disappointed with him. It's because, you know, they still like him. But these swing voters have become incredibly opposed to what he has done in office. It is his actions and his policies and his words, not his persona, that has driven them into opposition in a pretty profound way. How profound? Take a look at the 2010 elections. Republicans picked up an unbelievable number of seats in the House and the Senate, and when it went all the way down the ballot. We picked up more state legislative seats than we've done since any time since the 1920s. And it was a rejection of this president and his policies by people who still had some fondness for him and some hope for him, but felt terribly disappointed by what he'd done in office. And the interesting thing is, is that it's the big issues that they care about. Jobs, the economy, 9.1% unemployment. Sounds like a big number, but make it even bigger. That translates into 14 million of our fellow citizens who cannot find work. 45% of them have been out of work more than six months, the highest percentage of long-term unemployment since the Great Depression. The unemployment rate among young people is over 50%, the highest rate since the Bureau of Labor Statistics began keeping numbers by age in 1948. And it wasn't supposed to be this way. He said, I got a Democrat Congress, give me a stimulus bill. Let me have $862 billion of the taxpayers' money to spend, and unemployment will cap out at 8% by the end of the summer of 2009 and decline to where today it was supposed to be at 6.1 or 6.2%. He got what he wanted. It wasn't like anybody stood in, their, in the way of him getting what he told us was necessary to get the economy moving. And yet we've lost 6.5 million jobs since he took office. And the unemployment rate is well above the highest level. The, la the last president to get reelected with an unemployment rate of, seven point, of more than 7.2% was in 1936. He got what he wanted. He told us what would happen if he got what he wanted, and it didn't happen. And the disappointment and frustration of Americans about the economy is real. The second thing is really interesting to me, because in politics, there are concrete issues and abstract issues. Concrete issues are things that affect us. Pocketbook, your job, it's concrete. You know, your kid's education, concrete. The safety of your communities, concrete. The quality of our lives, parks and recreation, concrete. But they're also abstract things which occasionally, but only rarely, make their impact felt in politics. And one of the most abstract issues is spending and the deficit. You know, when we start talking trillions, it's hard to sort of get your hands around what it is. And yet the issue of deficit and debt and spending has become, for once, a highly concrete issue. People are concerned about it.
and for good reason. I want you to think about this. During the Bush years, the deficits ran and the public debt of the United States. The public debt is what has been securitized in the form of a bond and sold to somebody, a treasury note. During the Bush years, it averaged 36% of GDP, the public debt. Down from where it was under Clinton, down from where it was under 41, down from where it was under Reagan, down from where it was under Carter, down from where it was under Nixon. Because since World War II, we've been in a 40 some odd year secular decline, not always, always down, but occasionally bumping up, but generally over the course of that 40 some odd years, declining as a percentage of the GDP. The day that President Obama took office, the public debt of the United States was equal to 40% of GDP. By the end of his first year, it was equal to 54% of GDP. By the end of his second year, last December 31st, it was equal to 62% of GDP. As of this morning, it was equal to 70% of GDP. By the end of the year, it will be equal to 72% of GDP. And if between the $800 billion that was cut earlier this year and the $1.2 to $1.3 trillion of spending that the so-called super committee has to come up with by the end of November, if we get all of those spending cuts, $2.1 to $2.2 trillion in spending cuts over the next decade, the GDP, the public debt of the United States will be equal to 74%, excuse me, 76% of GDP by the end of the decade. Four points higher than where it will be at the end of the year. We haven't turned it back down. We've simply slowed its extraordinary growth. And why? Because of two things. First, the aging of the baby boomers is starting to drive costs for Social Security, Medicare, veterans benefits, and other mandatory spending up. But more important than that is, is it's in January 20th of 2009, the discretionary def budget of the United States government has grown 84%. Has your family budget grown 84%? Have the sales of your company grown 84%? If so, I'd like to invest in it, retroactively. <laughs> This is why the president's approving, look, the average cat on the street can't tell you these numbers. But they just have a growing gnawing sense that something is out of control in Washington. All of us have had to make tough decisions in our own family budgets. All of us are aware of the tough decisions that have had to be made in the enterprises in which we work. And yet we look at Washington and we say, what the heck are you doing? So while they may not know the numbers, they got it. And for once, the issue of spending and deficit and debt is highly concrete in the, in the hearts and minds of American voters. And it's what's created the Tea Party movement in large measure. <laughs> then we get to the third issue, the one that took so much of his time in 2009 and early 2010. While the economy is ragged, the president's focused on what? Health care. Now this is really interesting to me for a couple of reasons. First of all, because it is the only major piece of social legislation passed since the 1930s that has become less popular after it passed. Seriously. If you look back and look at controversial pieces of legislation like open housing or the 64 Civil Rights Act or welfare reform or education reform or the original Medicare or the original Social Security, you name it. Tax, the Reagan tax cuts, you name it. Wherever they are in terms of popularity at the time of their passage, six months, 12 months, 18 months later, they're more popular. And why? Because we're practical people. They got it done, let's try, and, let's try and live with it. Except in one instance, the Affordable Care Act. When it passed, an average of 41% of Americans approved it and 44% opposed it. And those who strongly opposed it outnumbered those who strongly favored it by two to two and a half to one. Today, Polster.com at Huffington.post, HuffingtonPost.com, one of my least favorite sites, incidentally, <laughs> reports that it's 38% in favor and 47% opposed. Nothing's ever happened like that. And why? I think there are two reasons. One is, every single major promise made about the bill is turning out not to be true. The president said by the end of 2010, Average household premium will go down $2,500 a year. Instead, we had an 8% increase last year, 8.5% increase this year, and 8% increase projected for next year. Oh, if you like what you got, you can keep it. Tell that to the seniors who have Medicare Advantage plans and are already losing their existing coverage. 
Tell that to the estimated 78 to 87 million working Americans who are likely to lose their employer-provided coverage, according to studies from McKinsey, PricewaterhouseCooper, National Center for Policy Analysis, and others. Oh, it's not going to get in the middle of you and your relationship with your doc. You go talk to your doc about that one. Physicians Foundation did a survey last fall. 59% of doctors said as a direct result of the Affordable Care Act, they would spend less time with their patients. Of that 59%, over 90% of them said it would be their Medicaid patients, and almost 90% of them said it would be their Medicare patients. Think about that. Poor people and seniors. Less, less ability to talk to their doc. And more surprising and frightening than that is, 40% of doctors said as a direct result of the Affordable Care Act, they were more likely to leave the profession early. Just at the time when a lot more people are going to be needing health care, we're going to have doctors and health care professionals bailing out. Oh, we're not going to tax anybody under $200,000 a year. Except that the Affordable Care Act is paid for by half a trillion dollars worth of taxes that include a tax on every health insurance premium in the country, every health insurance policy, 2.5% tax a year, a tax on hospitals, a tax on drug companies, and a tax on medical device companies. Now look, I'm from Texas. We're not all that bright. So my state senator asked a simple question of the director of the Congressional Budget Office. He said, Director Elmendorf, will these taxes be paid for by the companies or will they pass them on to their consumers? And Douglas Elmendorf said, of course, they will pass them on to their clients. So think about it. We're going to tax people who have to go to a hospital to have an operation, Uncle Harry who needs a hip replacement, Aunt Martha who needs diabetes medicine, and everybody in America stupid enough to purchase a health insurance policy to protect their families, we're going to tax every one of those people more in order to pay for the Affordable Care Act. And guess what? I think a lot of them make less than $200,000 a year. In fact, you may not know this. Did you know there is a special tax on, wait for it, kids with federally guaranteed student college loans? Did you know that? How many of you know somebody who's going to college on a federally guaranteed student loan? Uh, before the Affordable Care Act, you could go get a federal, you could go get a loan from your local bank with a federal guarantee that would be drawn from a pool of private capital from a banker who wanted your business, wanted your credit card, wanted your car loan, wanted the mortgage if you bought a house, wanted your dad's, you know, wanted your dad's investment account, wanted your mom's small business loan. You could go to a local bank and get a federal loan, federally guaranteed loan from a private pool of capital. Now they said under the Affordable Care Act, we're going to abolish that. If you want a federally guaranteed student loan, now you've got to go to the people who run the post office. <laughs> and the TSA. And we will borrow money we do not have from ourselves at 2%. And we will loan it to college students at 6%. And we'll collect four points of interest in between. It will amount to $9 billion over the next decade. And that inter those interest payments will go to pay for the Affordable Care Act. But guess what? I have yet to meet a college student who makes more than $200,000 a year. But the worst thing about it is, is that this bill is going to be paid for with a stream of red ink. The President said it's going to save us $143 billion in deficit reduction. That was in February. Then in April they came out and said, oops, we left out the cost of implementing the bill, which is $115 billion. So it's only going to save us $28 billion. But in reality, it costs us $700 billion in red ink because it borrows half a billion dollars from Medicare, $53 billion from Social Security, and $70 billion from a new insurance premium pool for a long-term care policy that they were supposed to try and sell us from the government, which last week they realized they couldn't make it work. But it's financed by borrowing $700 billion over the first 10 years to pay its $1 trillion, $55 billion cost. How sustainable is that? We sent Bernie Madoff to jail for less. <laughs> now, I think there's another reason why it ain't working. It's because there are 14 million people who work in the healthcare field, 600,000 people who work for, for pharmaceutical companies, 500,000 people who work for health insurance companies and 500,000 people who work for medical device companies and they know what is happening to their profession or their businesses as a result about it and they're talking to people about it and who are you going to believe 
some politician, even if he's the president, or your doctor when it comes to health care. Look, I got the world's greatest nose doctor. I had sinus surgery earlier this year. She's not only a fantastic surgeon, but she's got the best name of any nose doctor you've ever heard. Dr. Catherine Picken. She says the world's divided into two groups, those that look and those that don't. You figure it out. But she's wired up about the bill. And so are a lot of healthcare professionals. Now these three issues, jobs in the economy, deficit spending, and the Affordable Care Act are a toxic stew for the president. Because it means he can't run by saying, vote for me, I've done a great job. But there's one other thing. It's not just the failure of his policies, it's the dissonance between what we thought we heard in 2008 and what we've seen in the years since. He was going to elevate it. He was going to bring us together. He was not going to be the president of red or blue, but the United States. And instead, we have seen a different attitude in the White House, and it started early. Remember the meeting in late January of 2009 about the stimulus bill when the House Republicans led by John Boehner and Eric Cantor came in, and Cantor was the guy who was supposed to say, Mr. President, we have some ideas about how to improve your bill, and the president cut him off and said, I won. That's not a guy who brings us together. If you're going to be president, you have to compromise in order to bring people together. Look, Bush had a slightly more acrimonious election in 2000. You may remember a thing called Florida. <laughs> and yet, with a Democrat Senate and a Republican House, by June of 2001, we'd, pushed, we'd passed through the Bush tax cuts. And we got a quarter of the Democrats in the Senate to vote for it, including the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee today, Max Baucus. And how did it happen? Because we negotiated. They said it can't be a tree in seven, it's got to be a tree in three. You can't have the top rate be 33%. That's, that's an important barrier we don't want to touch. You've got to have it at 35. Any of the money freed up by moving it up to 35 has got to be given to people at the bottom in rebates. We, we said that doesn't make good economic sense. They said that's our price. And you've got to put an expiration date on it, 10 years. And do we want to do that kind of stuff? In a perfect world, no, but you've got to deal in the real practical world of politics and to get it done and to, and to have committee and get buy-in, we had to do it. And yet this president's attitude is, I won, get lost. And he also has this habit of ascribing to his political opponents views they do not have in a way to demean them. And it is unworthy of any president to do this as often as this man does it. In July, he gives that speech before the Congress. Let's come together and pass a new stimulus bill. My job's the American Jobs Act. Let's come together, Congress and Republicans and Democrats alike, to do it. And the third paragraph from the end, he says, I know there's another view of what we ought to do. That view is shut down the government, return the money and the regulation, and tell everybody you're on your own. But that's not the way of America, end quote. Oh, really? Who said shut down the government, give all the money back, end the regulation, and say you're on your own, buddy? I'm not certain that I've heard that from a single Republican. And yet he then said, you're un-American. And he keeps doing it. Two days ago on the official bus trip, he says, I know what the Republican jobs plan it is, is, quote, let's have dirtier air, let's have dirtier water, let's have fewer people with health insurance. Who the hell is saying that? And it is unworthy of this president, of any president, to do that. He thinks this helps him. I guess I should be happy that he's saying these kind of things. That he's offering up these phony straw man arguments. Because if he thinks this is helping him with independent voters, they're sick and tired of this from their president. They want somebody who's going to bring us actually together, not say one thing in order to get elected, and then operate from a position of arrogance and bullying and straw man and phoniness that he's operated from. Now having said that, he ain't going to be easy to beat. He's going to have one billion dollars, as he keeps reminding us. At times, he reminds me of Dr. Evil. One billion dollars. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. It's this one, isn't it? It's like that, yeah. But he's also going to have the power of the White House. You're the president. You can do things. If he was smart, he would have started doing things last January. 
Imagine what it would look. He stands up in the State of the Union and says, my focus is on high-speed rail, high-speed internet, and my personal favorite, quote, countless green jobs, end quote. Sounds a little Solyndra, you know? <laughs> jobs went away. What if he stood up and said, you know what, I'm the president. I think there's a wide agreement in our country that our tax code is broken. Let's come together as Democrats and Republicans as, they did, as we did under Ronald Reagan in 1986 and reform taxes. What would have happened? It would have helped the economy and would have caused people to say, you know what, he's a leader. What would have happened if he'd sat down and said, look, let's come together on a jobs bill that Republicans and Democrats can, can support and I want to have honest negotiations with you. We'd be in a different place than the Republican plan is let's have dirtier air, dirtier water, and fewer health insurance. As a result, he's not going to be able to run for re-election unless he irradiates his opponent. Seriously. And it's going to be one ugly contest. Not going to be good for the country. But he can't say, vote for me because you love my stimulus bill. Vote for me because you love what I'm doing with the budget and deficits. When I was attacking Bush for having a $131 billion deficit, you thought I was attacking him because I thought it was too big, but actually it's because it was too little. <laughs> that deficit was only 1% of GDP. I have a deficit that's 10% of GDP, and I've done it three years in a row. You know, when, 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 you didn't see it in California, but do you know what the second most widely shown television ad of the Obama campaign was in the fall of 2008? On health care. And you know what it said? Quote, government-run health care, extreme, end quote. So now we got a government-run health care bill. So he's not going to be able to say, vote for me because of these three popular things I've done. Spent your money, you know, failed to create jobs, and shoved a health care plan down your throat that you don't like. So he's going to have to irradiate his Republican opponent. Now this is going to be an interesting contest to watch for any political junkie, because it's going to come down to a handful of states. First of all, even if the Republican candidate wins only the states that John McCain won, the election is closer in the Electoral College by 12 votes. Because red states like Texas and Georgia and South Carolina and Arizona and Utah picked up votes in the, in the Electoral College through the census, while blue states like New York, Michigan, New Jersey, Massachusetts lost votes in the Electoral College. And for the first time since it joined the Union in 1850, California failed to gain any strength in the Electoral College. In some quarters, that'd be called self-hatred, but I don't know. But then the Republicans have got to win back 39 Electoral College votes in three states, Indiana, North Carolina, and Virginia. Indiana and Virginia last voted for a Democrat for president in 1964, North Carolina in 1976, and Obama swiped them all by narrow margins. Three-tenths of one percent in North Carolina, one percent in Indiana, for example. If we get those back, we get a big jump. And today, I think Indiana and North Carolina are gone for him. Then win Ohio and Florida, both of which switched from Republican in 04 to Democrat in 08, but did so swung from one column to the other by less than the national margin. Narrow victories in both, 4% in, in Florida, two, two, excuse me, in, in Ohio, 2.8% in Florida. Guess how many other states Republicans need to win in order to win the election that they didn't win in 2008? One. Yes, you watched me on Fox, didn't you? <laughs> one or actually none. One state. New Hampshire or Pennsylvania or Michigan or Wisconsin or Iowa or, North, or, or New Mexico or Nevada, uh, all of, any one of those would do it. And of course, most of them voted Republican in 00 or 04 or both. But it also may be zero because Pennsylvania and Michigan are about ready. Pennsylvania is publicly involved in the process of deciding to follow the lead of Nebraska and Maine and awarding their, their electoral college vote on the basis of the congressional district. And while, you know, Pennsylvania, 20 electoral votes, two statewide, 18 in congressional districts, the Republicans have like 13 members of Congress and probably will be guaranteed to carry 10 or 11 or 12 congressional votes, which would give us the election even if we didn't pick up another state. Now, 
I don't know what's going to happen. I do know this. It matters what happens. This is not an inconsequential presidential election. I'm reading a book. I was rereading re a book called Lincoln's Speech is Reconsidered. And I was reading the House Divided speech. And I suddenly realized what an apt metaphor it is for our situation today. Not because we're fighting over slavery, but because we're fighting over the course of what America is going to look like. We can't be two things simultaneously. We can't be the view of Barack Obama and our view of what America's future ought to be like. We can't be those things simultaneously. We've got to be one or the other. And this election will settle it. Anyway, I intend to do my best to affect the outcome. I hope you do too, regardless of what side you're on. That's what America's about. Thanks for having me. I'm going to answer duck questions now. All right, I have a microphone, and if you'll raise your hand, I'll bring it over to you. And if you'd stand up and state your question, our speaker will answer it. So who would like to be right, there first? There we go, over there. There, there Sandy, right there. there. We are. All right. And where, where we see another question over there. Keep your hand, because he's going to bring the microphone back to one of you shortly. Yeah, I have a question, Mr. Owen, again. Thank you for a very inspiring speech. Uh, do you think Rush and Mark Levin are favoring or... Uh, helping Obama by their comments about one of our nominees. About about uh, the comments about what? One of our nominees. One of our nominees. No, look, I, I don't. Uh, we, we, we need to have a robust process to pick our nominee. We don't need to say things that are going to make it impossible for us to win, but, but, you know, look, our candidate at the end of the day will be better by having a robust contest than not. Now, we got pretty close the other night to saying some ugly things the candidates saying ugly things about each other, and I hope they step back a little bit. I, I really don't think, for example, and I'm not picking a side, I, my, the governor of my state was out of bounds when he called uh, Mitt Romney the biggest magnet for illegal immigration simply because he had a lawn service company that didn't live up to expectations on having legal workers. Fired him. That's not being the biggest magnet. I can think of a heck of a lot more big magnets than that. So, but, but he didn't advance himself, and most times, let's be clear about it, when you, when you go over the top, you hurt yourself more than you hurt the other guy. Uh, but I, I, want, I want us to have a robust contest because, look, you know, whoever gets this has it, it, got to be prepared, you know, they win it in March or April, they got to be prepared for seven or eight months of wearing Kevlar underwear. Because they're going to the, be in one ugly fight. These guys from Chicago are tough. And... Uh, you know, look, they've only gotten more sophisticated since they sw swiped a few votes in 1960. Hello. Yeah. Yes. I've been watching the debates, and I've been listening to some comments about Newt Gingrich. Um, in my opinion, humble as it is, believe me, um, I see him on the stage in the debates as being extremely competent, very knowledgeable. He doesn't get into the fray that goes on. And I wonder if you could comment on his possibilities. And I don't understand the egregious activities that happened before that apparently are keeping him from being yeah. nominated. Um. Newt has helped himself in the debates because he's come across as an adult who knows a lot, and, he, and he's both. You also, though, have to do the other things in a campaign. You have to raise money. You have to build an organization. You have to build a team that can help sustain your campaign. And you have to campaign aggressively in the early states. I'm not certain how much he's doing on those things. He hasn't raised much money. His campaign staff resigned in Moss during the summer because his wife insisted on going through a cruise in the Greek islands. And he spent very little time in the early battleground states, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina. I've known Newt a long time, and I respect him. But if he wants to be serious, he needs to be very serious about spending time in these early states. In Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina in particular, they want to see you. They're small states. It's not like California. They want to see you. They want to hear from you. They want to have a chance to question you. And they're keenly aware of the big role that they play in the early contests. And I, I was in Chicago recently giving a speech, and a guy came up to me, Commercial Club of Chicago. A guy comes up to me and said, Newt's not going to win. I said, well, that's a strong opinion. Why do you think that? He said, because last Saturday he spent the entire day, he said, I'm, the board, I'm on the board at the big museum there. He said, Newt spent last Saturday all day 
wonderful, delightful day in the Midwest, a lovely day to be attending things in Iowa. He said he spent the entire day at the Field Museum touring the dinosaur collection. And you can't, look, we've all got our personal passions. I'm a practicing philatelist. I would love to go to the National Stamp Museum, but if I were a candidate, I wouldn't be able to. And similarly, Newt faces this challenge. Now, the good news is that Newt's still got a little bit of time because he's doing so well in these debates. A friend of mine went up to him, not at the last debate, but the debate before that, and said, hey, Newt, friend of Newt's as well, said, Newt, said, uh, Trump had his surge in the spring, and then we had the Bachman surge, and then Perry had his surge, and Kane had your surge, uh, had his surge. When are you going to have yours? And Newt looked at him, and I don't know if Newt was, was, realized he was being joshed or not, but he said, in all seriousness, Celeste and I are hoping for December. <laughs> Ms. Robe, it's an honor to hear you talk tonight. What should Herman Cain do to get the nomination? Be serious. Look, I like Herman. He's a very good guy. He's a talk radio guy. But look, you can't stand up there and toss out 999 and not be able to defend it intellectually up one side and down the other. And, you know, he's, he's by not when Look, for example, the other night he was, he was in the debate. They hit him on it. They said 9% sales tax. And he sort of said apples and oranges. Well, there's got to be a better than line that because, it, look, you will pay a 9% federal sales tax on top of a 9% local tax. And you've got to have a better explanation than to say apples and oranges. The same on the 9% corporate tax. Most of us think that that 9% corporate tax is a profits tax. Take your profits, I mean, take your sales, less your costs of doing business, that's your profit, times 9%, and that's your tax, right? Uh-uh. You take your cost, you take your sales, less your cost of materials and other inputs, excluding labor, multiply that by 9% and pay it. Now, what's that called? That's called a value-added tax, and it's on his own website. And he said it's not a value-added tax. Yes, it is. That's exactly what the Europeans have. Cost, uh, you know, revenues, less cost of inputs, including materials, but excluding labor times whatever effective tax rate you got, and that's what it is. And it's going to be a huge generator. So you've got to be out there and defend it. Second of all, you better do your homework. It's not enough to answer a question and say, look, I'm unfamiliar with the Palestinian right of return. I don't know whether I'm a neoconservative. You know, and you can't have non-answers. You have to have studied for this. This is a serious job. We've seen for the last two and a half years what on-the-job training in this job results in, and ain't it pretty sight? <laughs> Mr. O, good evening. Uh, my question relates to the uh, purported $1 billion campaign that Mr. Obama is going to bring into this campaign. First of all, who or what are the principal donation forces behind that? And number two, what are the Republicans going to do to combat that? Because money talks in this yeah. country. Yeah, uh, the, the, the principal source of that money is goofy liberals. <laughs> now, I don't think he's going to raise a billion dollars. I wrote a piece for, the, for uh, foxnews.com uh, where I said uh, after, after he turned in his first quarter where they raised $87 million for the Obama campaign and the DNC, and I said, Mr. Impre the title of it was, Mr. President, I'm impressed, but not that impressed. Because think about it. The first quarter he raised 87, now he's raised 70, so he's got about $150 million uh, raised. That means he's got $850 million yet to raise. He spent, he got $150 million in two quarters. Now it's going to, he's got four and a half quarters to raise $850 million. You do the math. He's going to have to raise it at better than twice, in fact, almost three times the rate that he has been raising it. And I don't think he's going to be able to do that because there's only so many times you can go and find rich liberals in New York or Southern California to write you a check. And we've seen in some of these recent events that he's coming up short. He's having to, de to, to discount it. Look. He has he is off to a good start, but he's he's spending a lot of time at it. The first he and Bush had the same first quarter, roughly the 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 the, the second quarter of 2003 for Bush, second quarter of 2011 for Obama. In his first quarter, in 91 days, President Obama had 33 fundraising events. That's a lot of time on any president's calendar, a lot, particularly when six of them are in Southern California. Bush had. Four. 
And he's been in a lot of time, and he's, and he's chewing up those opportunities. The second thing is, you're right, we need to counter it on the other side. I'm, I'm helping raise money for American Crossroads. We raised $72 million in 29 weeks last year, spent $40 million of it in center races and $30 million of it in house races. We're going to raise $240 million this time around to beat President Obama. With, with the Occupy Wall Street and the Tax the Rich, the um, Democrats seem to be intent on class warfare. How effective is this and what kind of an issue is this going to be yeah. in the election? Look, this is not an effective issue if responded to properly. Because we're not a country built upon envy. First of all, let's talk about the Occupy Wall Street. This is not going to be a significant phenomenon by next year's elections. This is not a movement. This is a series of events. These people don't know what they want other than that they hate capitalism. And, you know, they, you know, they, they are, you know, watch them. I mean, we got self-described anarchists, self-described socialists, self-described, you know, we got a bunch of anti-Semites. You turn on the tube and there's some guy talking about the Jewish leeches on Wall Street and nobody there to police that kind of talk. And then we got the LaRoucheites. You see these very effective and the, very nicely done end the Fed signs? Lyndon LaRouche. And look, any movement led by people who don't know what they want is ultimately taken over by people who do know what they want. And the people who are going to take this thing over are going to be some far left-wing fringe group like the Democratic Socialists of America who are well organized and grab control of the levers of this thing. But I think it's more likely to fade. I think what happens is when a cold rain starts to fall consistently in Zucchetti Park, <laughs> they're going to fall apart. Now look, I, 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 I love it. President, Pre President Obama, you know, this frustration is represented in the Tea Party. You know, uh, Nancy Pelosi, God bless them for their spontaneity. The only time I've heard her make a religious reference. <laughs> And my personal favorite, Joe Biden, who says, this reminds me of the Tea Party. Oh, really, Joe? The Tea Party goes and gets permits for its protests and cleans up its trash afterwards. These people started by illegally occupying a public, a private park and then blockading the Brooklyn Bridge. The Tea Party reveres the Constitution and wants to work within the system. This group hates our system, hates our country. 31% in a poll of the, of, the, of the Occupy Wall Street people in Zuccotti Park said the United States is morally equivalent to Al-Qaeda. 34% in a Doug Schoen poll said violence is an acceptable means to achieve their goals, whatever those nebulous goals are. I mean, yeah, this is the Tea Party. I've met a lot of very violent 75-year-old women in the Tea Party. <laughs> Do you think one of the like, make or break things for the candidates this year is going to be the, uh, the tax plans? And do you think also that like, uh, ever since 999, each candidate has kind of come up with their own version of it? Uh, yeah, yeah I, th I think tax is going to be a big issue because look, the question is what do we need to do to spur economic growth? And, I, and as conservatives, we believe that if we have a pro-growth economic policy, a pro-growth tax system, we'll get more jobs. And look, we, the code is, since Ronald Reagan cleaned up the code in 86, it's been gooked up with a lot of, of exemptions and privileges and deductions and complicated things that benefit the few at the expense of the many. Clean them out and lower the rates. You know, what about, think about this. We're the only major industrialized country in the world that says, if you're a U.S. company that has a foreign subsidiary and you sell a good or service in some other country and make a profit on it, if you dare to bring that money back to the United States, we're going to tax it a second time. You're a German company, you're Siemens, and you sell an elevator in Southern California and you pay U.S. taxes and you want to bring the profits home to Germany, they say, bring them on. In the United States, if we have Hewlett Packard selling a printer in Germany, and they make a profit on it and they want to bring the profit back, we say, only if you pay a second tax on it. That's stupid. We ought to allow repatriation of foreign earnings. It'd mean more jobs, more capital, more investment in the United States. So yeah. And look, I 
I want, I want Republicans to take the lead and say, by God, we're going to face up to the fact we need to modernize our tax code. I also want Republicans who have the guts to stand up and say, we have made promises on Medicare and Medicaid and entitlements that we cannot keep and we need to reform these systems before they utterly collapse and, and doom our children and our grandchildren to purity because we can't afford them. We've got to have a candidate who's willing to do that. I love, your, I love your passion, Carl, and thank you for, it's a privilege to be here. I have one quick question. If we can manage to right this ship and throw out the baby with the bathwater next election, how difficult will it be to dismantle Obamacare? Here's the good, dirty little secret. They passed it using reconciliation, a budget procedure which requires 51 votes in the Senate, not 60. What you pass with reconciliation, you can repeal it with reconciliation. 51 Republican senators. <laughs> 51 Republican senators, a Republican House and a Republican pre president can repeal that sucker in January of 2013 if we have the courage to do so. And we better. Uh, Carl. Carl, do you see a uh, potential crack in the Democratic Party in the upcoming election? And if so, how might we recognize it? Yeah. Look, there's not going to be some big thing. We're not going to have a lot of Democrats say, we need to challenge Obama in the primary. It's not going to be 1968. You know, it's not going to be you know, 1980. But we are going to find a lot of Democrats, blue-collar working Democrats in the Middle West, college educated and women Democrats, moderate Democrats all across the country who say, you know what, I, I've had it. You, you've disappointed me. Stanley Druckenmiller was one of Obama's big fundraisers on Wall Street. He's deeply concerned about the fiscal position of the country and has said, I will do anything necessary to help elect a Republican president. Mort Zuckerman, Mort Zuckerman is a lifelong Democrat, the owner of US News and World Report and very successful commercial real estate guy. You may have seen his piece in the Wall Street Journal recently where he said, I voted for Obama, I had such hope and expectation, what he's done is wrong for our country and I will do anything I can to see him defeated. And that's, been re that's across the country. So we'll get some slice, 8%, 10% of Democrats, 95% of Republicans, 96% of Republicans, and 52, 53, 54, 55, 56% of Democrat of independents, and we'll win. We got 59% of independents in the 2010 election. That is a 24-point swing from, four, from two years before and a 36-point swing from four years before. That's a big swing, and it's because of the president's policies. Yeah. I want to know how we, as the voters, can toughen up the Republicans in Congress to stand up and talk like you do. I'm sick of the wussy. Thank you. Look, with all due respect, a lot of them do. Paul Ryan, for one. There are a lot of them. We gotta give him credit. Look, I'm a big fan of John Boehner. He's got one third of the reins of power and that guy has played, that guy has played his hand brilliantly. He's played it brilliantly. He's kept the people together. He's kept them united. He's focused on passing bills. There's no way the president can say we've got to do nothing Republican House because he's passed all these positive measures through that get locked up in the Senate. And next year we'll be able to say, well, wait a minute, Mr. President. We passed tax reform. We've passed repatriation of earnings. We passed all these measures which will help create jobs and economic growth in our country. And it's the do-nothing Senate head led by that Ninu from Nevada, Harry Reid. <laughs> Mr. Rowe, a few questions ago you said who, you know, we were talking about the, which candidate would have the, to stand up and uh, fight for that. Right. What candidate would you say? I, I'm and not secondly, saying. Why don't you think a vote? Yeah. Uh, going I, I'm not going to say because I'm focused on whoever comes. I want to, I'm, I'm focused on getting $240 million in the bank so when, when our nominee is selected in March or April and they're out of gas and out of cash and Barack Obama comes at them with a couple of hundred million dollars worth of advertising, somebody's there ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Obama. In fact, I've got to tell you, I hate to brag on us, we started buying television ads. We bought 12, we bought 16 and a half million dollars of them earlier this year. You didn't see them though because we ran them in Virginia, Florida, 
North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Colorado, Nevada, and New Mexico. Now we're following the president around. He was in St. Louis last week, we ran some ads. He was in, he was in North Carolina and Virginia, we ran some ads. And the ads feature President Clinton and President Obama saying we shouldn't be raising taxes when the economy's in trouble. And I love it. Because two days ago, President Obama stood up at a rally in Virginia and said, I was watching the television last night and I saw this ad and it didn't seem to me to make any sense. Yeah, Mr. President, you saying you don't believe we ought to raise taxes in a time of economic difficulty and then trying to do exactly that during a time of economic difficulty, it doesn't make any sense to me either. <laughs> but I love it that the President saw our ad and made the mistake of calling us out by name. Of course, it's not the first time we got his goat. When we were doing what we were doing last fall, he went to Towson State University, used my name, and called me and the organization that I'm involved with, quote, an enemy of democracy, end quote. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll wear that as a badge of distinction. And unfortunately, we didn't owe you a commission on the $14 million we raised in the next two weeks as a direct result of your attack. <laughs> we, um... We, have, we, we want to have time for the book signing, so we have time for, one, for two more questions. The gentleman here will ask the next one. Thank you. If uh, President Obama gets rid of Joe Biden and takes on Hillary Clinton as his running mate, if that should happen and nobody knows, what do you think will take place? Oh, I know. It's, I know. I know. That ain't going to happen. <laughs> Look, that's too duplicitous even for a Clinton. And he's not going to get rid of Joe Biden. He likes having old Joe around. Every operation needs a little bit of comic relief. <laughs> Last question over here. There we go. There we go. Right here. Not to put any pressure on it, but it better be a darn good question. <laughs> Uh, yes, as someone who was a lifelong Democrat and saw the error of my ways and I think part of my problem, I have several problems with the Republican Party, is no one in the Republican Party was ever in the Congress saying, this isn't good enough for me, it shouldn't be good enough for you, and they exempted themselves from Obamacare. How are any not, of Not a single Republican voted for that provision. Okay. So my question is, um, the Republicans have not done, in my opinion, a very good uh, public relations attack. The only question on Obamacare is if it's good, not good enough for the Democrats, then why is it good enough yeah. for you? Well, what actually, are we going to do about actually, that? Actually, the Republicans did an interesting thing. During this debate, they proposed a motion, an amendment. They said that, uh, remember, this thing says that uh, half of the cost of the program is to expand Medicaid by one third. So the Republicans stood up and said, we got, a, we got a narrow ability because of the rules to propose amendments, so we'll propose a germane amendment that says when we expand Medicaid, every member of Congress and every member of congressional staff and every member of the White House staff will be forced to go on to Medicaid. And guess what? Not a single Democrat voted to put themselves on Medicaid. <laughs> So, so they have tried this, but, but look, we don't, we don't control the biggest bully pulpit. We are not the president. We don't hold the White House. We, in fact, what we hold is one third of the, of, the, of the levers of power. We hold the House. And we can't expect until we get a nominee for us to have one person who can go mano a mano on with the president on these big issues. And even then, it's not up to them alone. It's up to every one of us. I carry a piece of paper with me that I try and read once a day to remind me of what our responsibility is. This piece of paper, keep it with me, in my briefcase or my pocket. I made a speech a couple years ago that I didn't want to make. I had a buddy call me up and say, could you come and speak on September 9th? He said, what are you doing on September 9th? I said, nothing. He said, will you come and speak to the Navy Special Warfare Foundation dinner? And I said, no, I can't. He said, well, now you told me you weren't doing anything. I said, I'll tell you why I can't. 
I say, because too many days at the White House began by me having to read a report about what our special operators, particularly the Navy SEALs, did in dark and dangerous places, and there's not a damn thing I can say to these men that would be worthy of them. He said, sorry, I told them you're coming. <laughs> so I went to speak. And I had a great evening. I had a spectacular time. I was supposed to be one of two speakers. I, the other guy was the deputy director of the counterterrorism center, which was sort of like the SAV. You won't be the only guy speaking. I, I, you know, this is my outline for my speech tonight. That's it. That night, I wrote down every single word of my speech. Every single word, because I knew if I got in front of these Navy SEALs and their wives, I couldn't, I couldn't, if I, if I started to lose it, I'd lose it. So I wrote down every single word so I could read it. And um, I had a wonderful evening. It was really spectacular. There was a, a group of SEAL Team 6 going out to Afghanistan. Every one of these guys was in civilian clothes because they all had beards. You can't have facial hair. Those of you are Navy veterans know you can't wear your Navy white, so you got facial hair. And these guys all had beards to fit in, except one guy clean shaven, Navy white. So I said, man, what's up with you? I said, your team's going to Afghanistan, and you're without your beard. He said, every one of my team has a girlfriend or a wife, and I want to get one before I go. <laughs> he, said, he said, I can grow the beard in country, but I can't get the girlfriend in country. <laughs> my buddy Jeff comes up to me and says, hey, I want to introduce you to a guy. He says, he's a huge fan of yours, Lieutenant J, last name classified. He'd like to come up and visit with you. He's a huge fan. I said, great, bring him on up. He said, I want to warn you, he's hard to look at. I said, beg your pardon? He said, yeah, he's hard to look at. Shot eight times in Baghdad. So I went to go get him. And I saw him making his way across the room. Not room, not much bigger than this, so I could sort of see him as they made their way over. Actually, a little bit, a lot bigger than this. But the guy's making his way across the room, and, he, and I could tell he's hard to look at. His face is all cattywampus and sewn up weird. Giant plastic thing covering a gaping hole in the side of his face. And I'm looking at this guy, and I'm saying to myself, this is one wounded spirit. I'm going to have to throw my arm around him and buck him up. And I couldn't have been more wrong. Guy comes up, and we start to talk, and he is funny and outgoing and charismatic and joyful and unbelievably excited about life. Powerful. I said to the guy, tell me a little bit about what you're going through. He says, he says well, hell. He said, every blankety-blank, 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 blankety-blank doctor wants to operate on you if you're a Navy SEAL who's been wounded because they want to brag about it afterwards. <laughs> he says, I've had the best care in the world. I said, What's come, what, what, what are you facing? What are you going to go through? He said, I've had 22 procedures. He said, I'm going to Chicago tomorrow. The best facial reconstruction guy in the country is going to rebuild my nose and my cheek. He said, hell, all I was trying to show was a SEAL could grab a bullet with his teeth. I said, I said, what's after that? What's, what's after that? He says, I got two more procedures on my arms, and then I'm back in the game. I said, I beg your pardon? He said, yeah. He said, my team's leaving for Afghanistan soon, and they need me. And you knew in that moment they did. Really terrific guy. And uh, I got up and gave my speech. The deputy director of the counterterrorism center did not show up. He had a real job, so I had to give my speech. I was the only guy. Next day, I drive back to Washington. My friend Jeff, who got me into this, it sends me an email saying, thanks, appreciate you coming. And I thought you might like these two pictures. And attached to them were two JPEGs. And one of them is a picture of Lieutenant Jay in his hospital bed in Baghdad. And it's a horrific picture. Because you cannot see how a human being could be alive under all those pads and devices and wires and tubes. And de I mean, it's just terrible to look at. And the other was this. And this is a sign that Jay, that Jay wrote and put on his Baghdad hospital door. And he took his Navy Trident SEAL emblem there and jammed it in the bottom. This is a big mojo if you're a Navy SEAL. If a SEAL team member is killed, his teammates take their Navy Trident SEALs and jam them into the coffin to be buried with their comrade. This is a big mojo. Attention to all who enter here. If you're coming into this room to feel sorry for me or my wounds, go elsewhere. The wounds I received, I received in a job I love, serving with people I love, supporting the freedoms of a country I deeply love. I am incredibly tough and will make a full and complete recovery. What is full and complete? 
That is the absolute utmost. My, my, physically, my body has the ability to recover. Then I will push that about 20% further through sheer mental tenacity. This room you're about to enter is a room of fun, optimism, and intense rapid regrowth. If you're not prepared for that, go elsewhere. Signed, the management. <laughs> now, I keep this, I keep this as a reminder of what it is that we have a responsibility to do. This kid loved his country enough that he went into, into combat got all shot up and said, send me back into the game, Uncle Sam. He loves his country that much. If we love our country, we don't have to go join the SEALs or pick up a weapon. We got to participate in our democracy by fighting for the things that we believe in and doing everything possible to tell our friends, our neighbors, anywhere across the country, what we feel, what our convictions are, what our passion is, and encourage them to join us in putting the country on the right path. Thanks for having me here tonight. The, uh, he just told me that, uh, yes, he will come back out here and run for Senate from the state of California. We need him, don't we? <laughs> now, you know that story I told you earlier about the bumper sticker on his bike basket and that girl 30 pounds bigger yanked him off and beat him up and gave him a bloody nose. Imagine what that did to his self-esteem and his ego. So, tonight's gift. I want to give him a new bumper sticker. What would, what would Nixon do? <laughs> Available by coincidence in our gift shop. There we go. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. He's going to the lobby to sign this book. It's for sale in our gift shop. Please join us and get his signature. Thank you.